right. So I'm gonna do two things today. I'm gonna record it on the audio machine and post that separately. I'll also post a link to the video recording if it works out as I, as I hope it will. Uh, and today I have, um, just to mention to you what I'm gonna do in this session. I, I sent you an email earlier and I hope everyone's receiving my emails that I've sent around. Uh, uh, you all should be on my list. You all should be on my list, so I hope that you're getting regular emails. And you should be getting, um, you should be getting a, an email or two before the lecture and an email or two after the lecture, just to keep in touch. And if there are issues with the lecture or the material or the context, please uh, use reply to um, so that I can follow the chain on my email. Uh, on, on the email so that I can follow what, what you're talking about. So please uh, make sure uh, when you do communicate with me, when you do log on to Moodle, that you've set your browser up so that you're logged on to your, uh, to your Brooks account. That way you'll have full access to all of the materials and also sometimes if you send an email from uh, a source outside of Brooks, it gets flagged up by the by my um, my filters, and I don't I don't actually get it. So make sure you're sending me emails and uh, along with in, in your book uh, in your books um, account. So I'm going to really do two things today. I'm going to present a lecture on historical perspectives and future promise of project management, and I'm also going to talk about the coursework which I've set and which I hope you've uh, had a chance to uh, to look through. Okay, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, uh, okay. So very good. So anyhow, I've I've arranged this um, this lecture, and there'll be a series of lectures al along the similar veins. I've uploaded it onto Moodle already, so you should be able to you should be able to see it online. Is that is that true? Can you see it online? Okay, and it should be the same as the one I'm presenting today. And the reason I'm doing this is just to set into context into a professional sense what it is that you're, you're actually learning, the profession that you're learning. And um, there's been a bit of, um, I guess, blending of roles or changing of roles over the, over the last uh, few decades. And what my lecture highlights or brings to the forefront is how this role is changing. And this change is being forced by some quite, I guess, dramatic events that are happening. One of these things is urbanization, the other one is a uh, uh, global warming, global climate change. Um, and then there's an advent of uh, the smart cities, the digital city. So these sort of three things combined together are actually leading to a much different work environment, a much different platform for your profession. And I want to just emphasize this and talk a little bit about, it, about this and make sure you understand the kind of breadth of the problems that you're dealing with. So I really have put it into a bit of a historical perspective. And the reason for doing that is I believe that there's big change coming. I think the best way to see or to anticipate or to prepare for change is to, is to take a look at the history. So anyhow, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, really an unabridged view, something unbiased. And um, I'll talk about some of the originators. It turns out that the, the sort of great thinkers in project management um, their words, uh, unsurprisingly, still hold uh, true today. Um, I'll talk about uh, the sort of systematic measurement, what are the principles involved, what are, what are the, the skills, what are the things that you need to do, and of course I'll put this into context of this data-driven era where we're looking at flows rather than objects or assets. So the shift toward in project management is in managing these flows. Flows of people, flows of traffic, data in general um, is dealt with best by looking at the flows of this. And in the future, our incomes are more likely to be derived from managing, accessing, altering, investigating, and controlling these flows of information or flows of materials. Right. Um, well, this is a bit of my underbridge view. Now, I've ordered a series of books. There's a, a, a fan, Mark uh, Kozak Holland. He, he investigated a series of historic um, 
buildings, I guess. The pyramids, um, the Colosseum in Rome, um, the Eiffel Tower. He did, he did sort of forensic project management analysis of these buildings. The uh, books themselves aren't particularly brilliant. But one thing he does do, is one thing is kind of deeply embedded in what he did, is that even before we have, even though we don't have historical, particularly good historical <coughs> records of these past creations, uh, in actual fact, they must have followed um, the basic rules of project management. That is, control of the materials, understanding of the workforce and how to manage it, the appropriate chains of commands established, the kind of schedules. And he, there was no possible way that they could have completed these structures without these, um, to have had these principles firmly in place. And if we just look at some of these great things, um, the Giza, the pyramids at Giza, it's possibly some of the greatest structures, most inventive structures ever, ever built. One of the best trips I ever took was actually to Cairo to see them. Uh, the Greek Parthenon, actually there are quite a, quite a number of, of Greek temples still in existing uh, today, and they're um, overwhelming monuments, they're incredible things. There's the, um, the temples at Paestum in, in southern Italy, there's some in Sicily, and um, there's no possible way that they could have built in such a short time scale, because they knew, they more or less knew how long it took to, to construct them. Uh, without having a scheduling system in place, without, without having, having to source the materials, without having to have alter, alternative sources for materials should they run out. And, um, and really that, uh, that, is, uh, that is, is true uh, as it was uh, 1,000 or 2,000 years ago as it is today. Uh, I'd also like to, to point out some, a few other things, the Colosseum and so forth. Many of these buildings were built in really uh, unfavorable locations. Um, uh, it's a, I guess it's a mixed blessing that cities, many cities, were built in, in areas that were formerly uninhabited. So part of the role of the, of the city itself was to reclaim lost ground. And um, many of these monuments exist today because after they stopped being used, the Colosseum was more or less abandoned. Um, it, was in, it wasn't in a particularly good part of Rome. It was prone to flooding. It was malarial. Um, the reason why it exists today is because it was abandoned. The, the temples at Paestum in Campania in southern Italy, they were kind of left to the weeds. They were rediscovered in the 19th century. Um, that's simply, they're huge, these things, but they were in such an unfavorable place. And I think that this um, is the sort of miracle of cities, is that they were able to reclaim other, well, Oxford is a perfect example. This, is, this was the original, where we're, the hill that we're sitting on right now was the original Oxford. And it was only in the medieval period that they settled in the valley because it was a infested swamp and it was most of the land that, that the city of Oxford actually makes up was unusable land. It was filled, there was years and years of rearrangement of the waterways and construction and building in order to, to um, elevate the land. Now this is a bit of a mixed blessing. Many of the coastal cities now are under risk due to um, sea level rise, rises in the sea level. And um, we already are beginning to see the effects of this taking place. So on one hand, the cities were used to colonize. Uh, that's the good bit. The bad bit is you move lots of people to areas that in the next 100 to 200 years, for some reason, might, may be uninhabitable. And I'll talk about different areas. Um, of course, these are not in areas that we know much about. We don't go there very often. Um, the Mekong Delta in, uh, in, in Vietnam, um, big parts of southern China are in estuaries, lots of people living there, uh, and they're highly vulnerable. Um, so uh, there's a lot we can learn from the past, and there are a lot of mistakes that we made, um, well, we made, that our ancestors made, <laughs> um, that are coming to haunt us now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mass production um, and the automation, uh, sort of the, the procedural basis of, of project management. So much of what project what we know about project management took place in the factories around, uh, around, well, in cities. I mean, Oxford had a 
had a, a booming, it still has a booming car industry, but this, is, this was sort of the Detroit of, of England for, for a while. Um, and um, it was, uh, it, uh, the idea behind it is that you concentrated resources, you made use of prefabricated materials, you had an assembly line where instead of the workers moving to, uh, to construct, you had, the, um, you had the cars moving on a conveyor belt, actually they were hauled along uh, in such a way as to um, allow specialization. So they would, a car would arrive in one station, you would have specialists who would fit the wheels or bolt the chassis on or fit the bodywork or something like that, and it would move on. And this seems completely unrelated to construction until we start to realize that construction is moving in a direction towards automotive manufacturing. And the more that we progress with off-site manufacturing, with componentized systems, uh, the more we move towards a system which, is, which resembles an assembly line. So there's an awful lot we can learn um, from that. Um, um, so the whole idea behind mass production, and it's one of the reasons why consumer goods, why washing machines and camcorders and automotive, automobiles on relative costs are really quite small. Um, I mean, they've, they've, in relative terms, the cost of manufactured items has reduced over the years rather than increased. I mean, they have increased, but they've, in relative terms to everything else, to other commodities, they have decreased. Um, and the idea behind this is you have high throughputs, you have a systemized work pattern, you have a, a strict schedule, you have an ordering system which um, ensures that the materials are available at the right time at the right place. Uh, and of course, this is susceptible to modern methods, computerized logistics and systems. And um, the mass production has sort of its upside, it has its downside as well. Um, you mechanize human beings and you turn them into machines. That's always a downside. Uh, you also concentrate everything in one place so that it's very easy to destroy by fire or by bombing, for example. Um, and um, uh, and uh, so that's, 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 sort of the, um, that's sort of the downside. The, um, the most pressing aspect of it is the way that workers are treated and um, the way that waste is managed, the way that effluents are managed. And so you end up concentrating uh, toxins in one place. So most of these post-industrial areas are you know, heavily contaminated. And as the cities change their use, they're moving into industrial areas. So if anyone lives in Cowley, um, Cowley from the bus station um, out used to be factories. So if you're living anywhere near there, you're living on top of an old factory. Right. Um, uh, indeed, the idea behind mass uh, manufacturing indicates that you need a new managerial system in place. And the managerial system for manufacturing requires sort of a manager versus employee uh, situation. And um, uh, unfortunately, we're left with a lot of the hangovers from that, from that past era, where you have a management class and a workers class. And this sort of reinforces other kind of class structures or other, other kind of social structures, which aren't particularly good when you come to a period when you need to innovate, you need to change, you need to develop small teams that are capable of doing quite extraordinary things. And, um, um, and this idea behind uh, vertical integration, where you have one company that does everything from producing the steel, bending the steel, assembling it, marketing it, selling it, painting it, um, whatever, re refurbishing it, repairing it. So this idea behind vertical integration works really well um, when you have mass produced, but it doesn't work so well um, uh, when you have assembled items. And the perfect, this building is an absolutely perfect advantage. This building is an assembled system. And we've had problems, teething problems with this building. This particular room isn't particularly well ventilated. Well, the company that installed the ventilation and did the engineering behind it, uh, they're in one place. The company that assembled it is in another place. Um, the <coughs> people that come back and service it, they're completely unrelated 
to any of these people. And so as a result, we, we, have, a, um, we have a system that doesn't particularly work, work particularly well. If we had to upgrade it, it would probably be quite expensive. Um, uh, we have a, we're having trouble retrofitting it or to managing it in some way. And I think this is a sort of a perfect example of a shift from manufactured, um, sort of uh, vertically integrated systems to componentized uh, assembly. Um, and we have there's other cheating problems with this building as well. Um, I, won't, I won't go into that, um, only to say that. Um, there is a solution, we think there's a solution, and I'll get to that later on. It's called BIM. Right. Um, they, uh, during the course of the Industrial Revolution, around the, I guess, the beginning of the 30s, when people were getting pretty experienced in working in factory situations, um, there was a lot of work that went in to try and sci scientifically analyze workers movements, workers' contribution. They realized that the worker was the basic unit of production and that if you studied it and if you actually made sense of it, you could improve uh, their ability to, to produce, to make it more efficient. And um, of course a lot of these things came about by these um, pretty young companies, Western Electric um, uh, in, Chicago, in, the, yeah, in Illinois, was um, was, was a, had, a re, had a research branch. And the research branch would go out and they would look at the shop floor and they would kind of look how things could be improved. How do you actually chip away at some of the inefficiencies of, of production? And um, this, of course, came to a great forefront um, by the, uh, in, in, in repairing um, parts of the world that have been damaged by war. I'll talk a little bit about this in some detail. Um, war was an absolutely dreadful, the world, you know, the two world wars in Europe um, were absolutely dreadful um, events um, and destroyed destroyed whole civilizations um, bit by bit. Um, however, from the point of view of manufacturing, um, it was pretty. It had great advantages, it's certainly in America, which avoided getting blown up, uh, but at the same time saw itself as a supplier of materials, not only weapons but all sorts of materials. For, um, for the war effort. Um, uh, there's another, um, there's a, there was another unexpected side benefit from war in that you were forced into fragmented production. So because you bombed out all the big, all of the big factories, the only way to produce was piecemeal. A, a, a part of it was here, part of it was there, and you had, in the, in the, in the end, what you had was componentized construction. So you had the, um, the wheels made in one place, the chassis in another, uh, and you assembled them in a, in a third place. Uh, and this idea behind componentized. What was that called? What was that called? Well, it's componentized production, yeah. I'll, I'll talk more about it. In fact, there's a whole, there's a whole there's, there'll be a whole lecture devoted towards, um, towards lean manufacturing. And, and I'll, go, I'll go back over this material uh, because it's, so, it's quite so crucial. But I, I just wanted to put kind of things in perspective today to give a bit of historical perspective because what I'm going to introduce later on is this idea about a digitized economy or a, dig, you know, you know, a city designed from the digits up. That's the concept behind the smart cities. And I'll get to that by the, by the end of the lecture, the whole lecture I have devoted to smart cities. Um, but by the end of the lecture, we'll be ready to hear about that um, because we're kind of looking a little bit historically and how things evolved. Um, I guess one of the great um, revolutionary um, <laughs> sort of inventions is this Gantt chart. And Gantt was actually the name of a, of a man, um, Henry Gantt. And um, it, it's nothing more than a, kind of, than a glorified calendar. Um, but there were, and there was a series of things that led up to it. There was something called pert, char pert charting that kind of fed into these things. But the, the fortunate thing about it is Gantt charting actually lends itself, because of the mathematics behind it, the scheduling mathematics, it actually lends itself quite kindly to being computerized. So some of the earliest project management software systems were actually designed to produce the Gantt chart. And it's still the Gantt chart that you see 
when you walk into a, a construction site, you know, there'll be a big Gantt chart on the wall. There'll be things all sketched all over it. And in the old days, they used to just make these things out of, out of, uh, out of paper. I mean, they still print them out and they kind of piece them together. Um, but the modern method now is to have, you know, to have it on your, on your laptop, on your desktop. And so often you don't actually see them when you go to look at a site anymore because they're, they're simply on someone's desktop and there may be a list of things to do that day or that week. Um, but, um, but the army was crazy about them because uh, they loved the regime and the regiment and so forth. And also, it's an awfully, um, much of what the development had to do with was preventing things like fraud. And a beautiful way to build in fraud into your system is to simply delay the project, divert managerial funds, um, double, double your, your, your purchasing of materials because the first lot of materials disappeared or expired, the du best, you know, best before the end of date expired, they couldn't use it. So this, um, the requirements, the regime imposed by the Gantt chart was sufficient to reduce the levels of fraud in the construction industry. Um, oddly, um, the, um, the Russians and the centralized the centralized economies of uh, Russia and, and China, they actually took upon the Gantt chart when they did their five-year plans. And mo most people don't hear about it or talk about it. But these central, um, centralized economies, they every five years, they issued a new five-year plan for industrial production. They would decide how much steel, how many cars, how many dishwashers, um, how many washing machines would be produced, and they stuck with this schedule. They ordered the materials. So they had this centrally planned uh, and they made use of all of these techniques quite happily, borrowed them from the, from the West. Um, anyhow, um, is anyone familiar with a Gantt chart? Does anyone know how it works? Should I breeze over this next bit? There's an awful lot you can learn um, just by reading the material that I've assigned. Um, certainly the books cover it really well. You'll have a chance to produce something of a Gantt chart. You'll have a chance later to, to learn how to use them more intimately. Um, I'll just mention this briefly. This was a project um, in Oxford at a college called Mansfield, and the building at the time was called uh, Love Lane. Um, it's not called that anymore. It's called the Hands Building, H-A-N-D-S. It has nothing to do with a person's hand. <laughs> it has to do with a guy called Hand, who, after the building was built, donated it to the college. So he came up with the money a bit late. And Love Lane is a, uh, it's a section of a, it used to be a public road that was closed in. On one side is Rhodes House, and the other side is Mansfield College. And Love, they used to call it Love Lane because I think the lovers would meet there. But now it's caged, on, blocked off at both ends. You can look into it, you can see there's no access to it anymore. But it was, a, it was actually a fabulous building, and I, and I was there weekly um, for about two years, I guess. Uh, um, and so I, I got to observe it step by step. And this is the Gantt chart that, that Bidwell's put together. Bidwell's was, uh, is a, one of the leading project management firms, construction firms in, in the area. And they've gotten one good job after another simply by, by being good project managers. So I, I got, it was a very good experience from the personal point of view because I got to see some really first class project managers in action. Uh, and Bidwell's is a great company if anyone, um, if anyone has an interest in it. Uh, but anyhow, the way that it works is you have a, a, a plan and then an actual. Um, so so each, each activity, the activities are listed here. There's a start date. Um, there's an end date. There's a duration. And of course, you're matching the projected against the actual delivered. Uh, and there's always a little bit of delay. But if, you're, if you cleverly design it, you built in slack. So you allow the fact that things take a little bit longer than usual. What they don't tell you is that you allow profits to be built in as well. So if the project manager can figure out a way to save money by shortening the project or by compressing the amount of time or reducing the amount of labor, the company makes money on that. So Bidwell's became famous or well-known or because they were very able to compress things. They were able to skim off, not skim off, but they were able to save money 
in multiple, in multiple tasks to accumulate during the course of the project so that the, the companies involved, the contractors, the general contractor, were actually to make more, make better profits. And the client was happy because things got done quicker and more efficiently and less messy. And of course, all of the people working on the project were happier uh, because they got, they got, they didn't lose their profits. They didn't, they didn't erode their profits by, by poor management. Um, here's a, here's a picture of the, of the, um, here's the picture of, uh, of the hands building. Now, um, you'll notice it is, I don't know, 20 something meters, 25, 26, 30 meters tall. Um, all of this is wood. It's a wooden building. And on the outside is a very thin cladding made of masonry. And it looks, if you look at it, if you're inside it, it looks like a masonry building. Uh, in fact, they used a very high grade of local stone. Um, it's easy to see, you can see it from the street. It's on Mansfield Road, uh, if you pass by it. Um, and it looks just like a typical modernish um, Oxford building made out of local stone, um, but it's made out of wood. Um, if they designed this building today, it would be illegal to build. And does anyone, has anyone been following the news? Does anyone, does anyone, I guess, understand why it would be illegal to build? Sorry? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I didn't follow what you uh, it, 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 in its current configuration design, such a building would not be permissible to because be built. Of the fire indeed, yeah, indeed, because of the new fire, exactly right. The new fire regulations prohibit the construction of any building over 18 meters in height that doesn't have complete fireproofing between the internal wall and the external wall. So from, from this point, <coughs> to the external cladding it has to be made of fireproof material. George, I, I was reading one of the uh, articles you put into your yeah. list, and I was uh, reading about this building in Austria where they're building 20 floors from timber frame. Yeah. In this. And uh, this was like committed in 2011 from CIOB. Yeah. Now, Austrian uh, health and safety says that the timber should last for 90 minutes. Yeah. So it gets burnt. And we are all part of the European Union, so <laughs> why is British standards so different to when we should be working towards a single... I know Brexit is happening, that's another yeah, story, yeah. but... Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, repeat that. I'll, re I'll repeat that question because it's a really good one. So the Austrian, uh, you read an article which I posted about a timber Austrian, building, a yeah. timber building that's uh, uh, 18 stories high or something yes. like that. It's not the only, in Austria it's not the only place. There's actually buildings in London which have been built up five stories, six stories. Yeah. In fact, they keep trying to compete with each other. Yeah, up to eight stories in London yeah. is the maximum they're allowed to be as yeah. a timber frame. But in Austria they've actually gone and built eight okay. stories and, and, and it passes. Right, this is, this is, this is a, um, this is the up, the, uh, the result of a series of um, very public and very, I guess, um, fraught or acrimonious um, consultations that the government had um, after the Grenfell uh, disaster. So, those of you not familiar, um, Grenfell Towers was a uh, a quite a large uh, tower block in uh, in West London, and it burned, and there was uh, more than 70 people killed. I'm, I'm going to talk about it later. I have a whole lecture. I don't want to cut into that lecture too much. Um, but the upshot is, um, after several years of deliberation and discussion, um, the upshot is that they've changed the regulations in um, in Britain to make them more restrictive. So it's actually acceptable in a federal system, federal legal system of the sort that the, um, the European community is, um, as long as we comply at least minimum with the European standards, we're, but we're allowed to actually create, we're, we actually are allowed to cre create legislation which is stricter than the European standards. 
So it's, it, what the upshot is, is that we have limited to 18 meters, residential buildings only. So you can build an office building, 18 stories, all out of wood, nobody cares. But if you build a residential building, it has to be limited to 18 meters. Yeah. Yeah. There'll, there'll, be, there'll be chance, uh, I don't want to discourage you from asking too many questions, but, but there'll be a chance to talk about this particular in much greater detail, because we're going to go we're going to go through the Grenfell uh, disaster just because it's a it's a um, it's a very it was a very disruptive thing that happened. I mean, people died. It was horrible. But actually, the legislation and the kind of uh, process that they went through, and it's only half finished. There haven't been any prosecutions. There hasn't been anyone who's been made culpable for for this disaster. And of course, anyone connected with it knows that it was a failure, multiple failures by planning, by the city for bad maintenance, the fire services seem to have done a, a pretty bad job as well. Um, so emergency service are implicated in this. They were, you know, the, the residents were given the wrong um, information. So there's a whole series of things that are tied up with this. And it, it's such a kind of changing, quickly changing area of, uh, of construction that I've devoted another session for that. So we'll talk about that in more detail. And there'll be plenty of chances to, um, uh, to talk about this. But anyhow, the hands building couldn't have been built. Um, if they tried to build it tomorrow, they wouldn't get permission. George, do we need to use that grant pass for our the first assignment? Yeah, you do. You, uh, you, OK, there's a good question, and I'll get to this a little bit more later. I'm asking you to produce a simple Gantt chart. doesn't mean you need a computer program to do it. You just have to understand the principles of a Gantt chart, and it's a very simplified chart, actually. So you what? to install the uh, software. Yeah, there, I, I, there is some software which you can. Unfortunately, we don't have a distance site license. We have, we have software installed on computers here, which you can use. Um, but the distance students can't use them. However, there is free software available for project for producing Gantt charts, um, which is available. I think there's a yeah, there's there's something on Moodle about it. But for the first assignment, you're not actually required to do anything on a computer. You can simply draw it out. You can use Excel. You can uh, you can sketch it out by hand. It's simply so that you understand the principles beside, besides a Gantt chart. A Gantt chart is nothing more than a fancy calendar. So I want you to understand. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't, don't. You, you keep saying that, George. The guy's going to turn it into grid. Yeah, except for Gantt, we'll, we'll turn it into grid. Right. Um, there's also other really cool things about this, this project. Uh, it was dual use. It's a, it's a human rights um, institute. And uh, Helena Kennedy, I think, is the, um, anyhow, there was money raised um, to, uh, there, was a, there was a lot of money raised to, um, to develop this building from multiple sources. And it has a dual use part, and you kind of enter one door and you're in one building, and you enter another door and you're in a residential building. Um, and you can actually kind of open the passageway between these doors to allow flow between windows. So it's a, it's a very cleverly, um, designed, uh, engineered. Uh, they used pods. Um, pods of these. Um, so the bathrooms came in these sort of big cardboard boxes, I guess. And they, you know, they were they were all tiled. Uh, everything was in place. The toilet, the sink, everything was grouted and ready to go. And they just sort of plopped them in place, jacked them up a little bit, bolted them down, hooked them up, and um, and this idea behind these pods became very popular. I think there were 70, 74 of them. Um, uh, there's, a bit of, there's quite a bit of steel in there as well. Um, these big open spaces underneath. There's a, there's a big lecture hall on this side of the building. You don't see it in here, but they, they put some big chunky steel in. Um, right. I'll talk a little bit about um, period of consolidation. Um, Skip through this. I'll talk a little bit about these sort of um, massive contracts. Um, IBM is the is a international um, 
business machines. It's a, uh, an American company, which is kind of famous for um, it surviving, I guess, the computer age. Uh, and they were the big, uh, the first big manufacturers of what was, was called mainframe compu computers. And sort of an institute like this or a research lab would buy one of one computer and would share it with everybody. And you'd submit jobs. And IBM is an amazing company. Uh, I'll mention them later on because when I start talking about blockchains and things like that, because IBM uh, is still in the game, mainly because they're pretty good at, at forward thinking. Um, they started doing something called PERT charting, which looks like a gigantic flow chart. And uh, I did mention this in the last thing. Um, something about the critical path method was developed. Critical path is, is the key structure in a, in a PERT chart, in a flow chart. Uh, it's kind of like the backbone of a project. It's the limiting length. It's actually the, the, uh, the longest such, um, the longest such continuous path uh, in a multiple path project. And it's this critical path method that's, uh, that's used and it's still used today. There's kind of no way around it. Uh, and you do things like crashing the path. So if you have one critical, if you have one area on the critical path which needs to be shortened, you simply throw resources at it and you crash it. You shrink it down. Uh, and then of course the critical path, once you shrink it down, it moves to another path. So you have to shrink that down. So um, uh, I think you'll, you'll understand this a little bit better when you start playing with these. Um, uh, I mentioned the Polaris submachine, uh, submarine in, the, in one of my last lectures. I won't go through it now. Um, I, will, um, I will skip um, to a slide called Modern Aspects. Yeah, Modern Aspects. Um, so uh, the, uh, the advent of new technologies um, really kind of provoked a, a, bit of a, a bit of a revolution in the way that um, project management was done. And the most notable one, the one that I'm kind of keen on you learning, is something called lean management. And if anyone's ever heard of it, it, it comprises actually, I mean, lean management is nothing but good management. Uh, and it comprises a bunch of sort of buzzwords um, that everyone seems to be familiar with, just in time. Everyone knows what just in time is. It means when you need something, there it is right in front of you. So it's delivered just in time. And uh, something called production leveling. Uh, production leveling is when you have multiple cells in a production system, and you figure out a way so all of these cells are being used in a kind of an equal basis, so that you don't overload one cell with a lot of work, and then it neglects another cell. You actually figure out a way of working so that the work is distributed evenly over a number of, 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 of production cells. And this just makes sense. You don't have people standing around waiting for their parts to be ready. Um, you try and balance things out. So you reduce the manpower on some cells and you increase it on others so that they balance out in some way. Uh, what else? Um, the, the main effect on the workforce is it actually empowers the worker much more. And this is sort of the key, one of those things that's overlooked when they discuss lean management. In one hand, it's more regimented and it's more sort of, it seems more sort of me mechanized. On the other hand, the worker himself or herself has much more power to decide on the production. So the worker themselves manages and controls that production cell. And within that cell, they have to meet the deadlines and so forth. But small improvements, incremental improvements, have to be done by the workers in the cell. So they're the ones who come up with a new jig, they buy a new piece of equipment, they have an optical device to make sure they don't make the same re repeated mistakes. I have lots of examples for that, and I'll talk about lean management in, in some detail. Um, again, as we move towards off-site construction, modular construction, the use of pods, uh, the use of computerized systems, all, we're moving into the realm where you can actually make use of lean management. So in a construction site, it's a mess, it's muddy, it's disorganized, the communication is terrible, people are shouting at each other. Lean management doesn't really work well. Lean management works really well when you have a nice, clean, orderly factory where the material comes in in different locations, get assembled, and ends up beautiful finished product. It doesn't work so well in a, in a messy construction site. But the components, the ones that are built off site, the, the sink units, the uh, the furniture, the, uh, the wall panels, 
uh, the ceiling panels, those can be produced off-site in really controlled and quite civilized conditions. Um, the other advantage is that you have this constant drive towards incremental improvements and uh, innovation. So any, any, anything you can come up, any device, any method you can come up to improve the situation, to improve the production, is, is valid, is useful, and is actually incorporated in the, in the workers in power. Um, the whole thing works because it's an obsession or a focus on the reduction of waste. Um, now, I don't want to cut into my lecture on lean management, but it would seem unusual that you, you would focus, you're, you want to improve production, so you focus on waste. That doesn't make sense. But actually, it's the reduction of different types. It's categorizing waste. It's, it's um, focusing on the reduction, systematic reduction of waste in all aspects, all angles of the production that you arrive at lean management. So lean management is really about the systematic reduction in waste. And I'm, I'm going to go into this in some detail later on because waste is characterized uh, in different ways. There's actually a formal approach to looking at waste. And we're not looking about just a scrap of paper. We're talking about wasted time, wasted movement, wasted energy, uh, wasted order, lack of order. Right. I'm going to mention a, a computer program now for the first time, Aclinex it's called. And I'm mentioning it for a couple of reasons. Um, students have, a few students have done their research projects on it. And um, it's also been bought by Oracle for like a billion, more than a billion pounds. It was a Canadian, Australian? Gosh, I think it was a uh, Australian company. And um, it's just a bunch of guys put together software. And what it does is it, is it sort of reproduces the Gantt chart, um, but allows the attachment to the, the Gantt chart of any sort of communication, an email, a document. So you, you have a visual image of a calendar. And attached to different parts of that calendar, you have communications. You can have a receipt. You can have uh, an email, you can have a phone call, and you can do it into the future. You can, you can put reminders. So it's, it's, it's like you're taking the Gantt chart into the modern era. Uh, it's like combining a Gantt chart with an active web page, where you click on something and it goes to a document, or it goes to a phone call or an email. And it's a very clever way of managing the disorder that's associated with um, a complex project. Um, and so at Conex, we managed to get a student license for it. Um, so if anyone is interested in, in pursuing a dissertation based on Aconex, I would, I, would, I, would um, I would thoroughly encourage it. It's based on, there's a whole school or a whole body of collaborative software that it's part of. Um, but it seems to be the one that's most, most enjoyed by the people who use it. So student, students came back from their work experience reported to me that there was this great software. I managed to get an educational license for it. We had a couple students looking at it and trying to investigate and trying to see if there was a research project. So it's an interesting thing to, to, um, to work on. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these characters uh, involved with project management because I think um, I've investigated a few of them in some detail. And they were incredibly charismatic. And they really focused on people. They were really trying to improve the, um, the conditions of workers. And the most amazing of these um, was Frederick Winslow Taylor, who was from Philadelphia, with a Quaker, actually. And he um, came from a very prominent family, but he was very sickly. And his parents didn't, normally he would have gone to the University of Pennsylvania and become a lawyer, gone to Washington, become a politician. Instead, he went. He ended up in a place called Stevens Institute of Technology, uh, which is, still exists. It's a very good technical university in New Jersey. And in those days, everyone was fussing over the steel. Um, that, that part of the United States was a bit like um, China is today, filled with factories. And um, he went from factory to factory and sort of tried to devise a scientific way to improve people's um, well-being, people's effectiveness at work. He thought that workers would be happier if um, they got more done during the day. Um, and um, he's um, credited, he made a fa fabulous um, fortune for himself 
Um, but he's also credited with being the world's first scientific you know, management consultant. And he made his money by charging out on an hourly basis his, his time. He was the first consultant, first management consultant. And um, unfortunately, a rather unfortunate um, name, he, Taylorism. The idea behind you're tailorized, you become tailored, you know. The idea that your life is regimented, you're, is set up by a Gantt chart, you know, you're controlled by someone else's schedule. And this Taylorism um, has received quite a, a bad name, I guess. And poor Taylor didn't deserve it. He was actually quite a philanthropic, quite a, quite a decent guy, really. Um, and he was competing with a guy called Gilbraith, who was a, a Brit, Gilbraith was another, um, was another um, consultant. He was a bricklayer, I think, from Maine. Yeah, he was a bricklayer from Maine, which is still a bit of an out of the way place. Um, not a very heavily, not a very populated state. It's in the very extreme sort of north uh, east corner of the United States. It's quite poor. Um, and um, he um, didn't have this nothing like the formal training that um, Taylor had. But he was a really instinctive guy, and he figured out a much better way for bricklayers to work. You know, he delivered the bricks uh, with a hoist. He set them up in a way that they could easily grab them. He had the, um, the cement made in one place and shifted it. It was given in the right dosage so that people could lift it. You know, he thought about, really carefully about it. And he extended this. Um, and the real brilliance behind um, Galbraith, because he didn't last very long, was his wife, who took over the, the family business, which was consultancy, and sort of created this whole, the whole like Galbraith Institute, and wrote a bunch of books, and she still kept making money uh, long after he was dead. And he was, he was very famous for these motion efficiency studies. You know, he thought that there was, he thought that there was sort of this science to the ability to, to uh, manage your motion at work. And he even invented sort of these strobe cameras that would film, you know, he filmed people at work and then sort of analyzed it frame by frame to come up with better suggestions on how to do things. So he was really, um, yeah, he was a big name. My favorite um, of them all is someone called uh, Edwards Deming. And he was, um, of all things, a statistician. And uh, um, he, um, was sent to Japan, it was after the end of World War II when Japan was pretty, the Americans pretty much flattened it, flattened the place. And um, he was sent to help reconstruct um, and help reindustrialize Japan, remodernize it. And he used this very statistical approach. But, uh, and he wrote a series of books about this statistical, the way of approaching production and so forth, he used statistics. But actually that wasn't the